So basically, uh, these are my disclosures. So the situation that we have been developing these drugs in colorectal cancer until now has been uh, really in a very wide uh, setting without any clear rationale for focusing on, on treating some patients in a different way than the others, except at the time that uh, we did have the EGFR inhibitors. And even on a retrospective basis, we were able to see that there were some patients that even they had expression of the epidermal growth factor receptor. It's, this is a very common phenomenon. Up to 95% of the patients express EGFR. But as most of the patients actually did not benefit from the treatment, we were able uh, to look for other determinants that actually were uh, biomarkers of uh, resistance. Uh, the first one, as you know, was KRAS, present uh, in around 40% of the patients. If we look only to Edson 2 uh, mutations, but now we know that this is uh, even um, with a higher proportion uh, because we look at different exons, not only uh, two, but three and four. Also, we were, we were aware that NRAS mutations confer resistance, as we will see. And finally, uh, there is the topic of VRAF mutations, whether they confer resistance to EGFR inhibitors or not. The important thing here, and the first key message perhaps, is that although that this is, uh, you know, from the cartoon perspective, it's like a, a very vertical pathway. So you have a receptor, you have different downstream proteins, and at the end the signal goes to the nucleus. Unfortunately, there are several pathways that produce redundancy, and actually uh, there are also some feedback mechanisms that upregulate other receptors in the malignant cell. And this is really important because actually helps us to understand why these patients that are treated with EGFR inhibitors and other targeted agents at the end do not respond, or if they respond to the treatment, they respond for a short period of time. So basically, what I'm going to be covering during the next 10 minutes is how we can treat these patients that have aberrations on the downstream signaling from EGFR, including KRAS and RAS and BRAF, with the compounds that are in clinical, in clinical trials, in clinical studies, like RAS inhibitors, very limited. I'm not going to cover this because they are very unique uh, for the time being. RAF inhibitors, MEK inhibitors, and ERK inhibitors. So basically, the whole history comes from the data that you will know on the retrospective studies. This is the Canadian uh, Australasian study. The Tutsimab in the refractory setting, we do know that patients that had uh, KRAS mutations did not benefit from the treatment, but those that had KRAS wild type tumors actually were those that benefit more from the treatment. We translated these translational results to the first line setting with a crystal study, the same, a clean study. Uh, Folfiri plus the Tutsimab compared to Folfiri. And again, only patients that had KRAS wild type the tumors were those that benefit from the treatment in terms of medians, uh, progression free survival, median overall survival, as well as hazard ratios. Very impressive data you have seen this morning. But important, the, the key message here is that the KRAS mutant tumors did not benefit at all. However, in this study, actually, there was a separate publication that took in consideration only those patients that had KRAS wild type tumors, but BRAF mutant tumors. First thing, you can look at the numbers. The numbers are really very low. So we have to, to take this uh, data, uh, you know, with caution. But the message for me, it's clear in a way that if you look at the hazard ratios, and the hazard ratios with this small amount of patients, it's probably the only um, parameter that we should look in detail. If you look at the hazard ratios for progression free survival and for overall survival, you can see that these hazard ratios are close to one. Basically, this means that these patients, when we add the Tutsimab and they have BRAF uh, mutant tumors, actually either do not have benefit or the benefit is very marginal. So this is, for me, it's very clear coming from these studies. Also, we have been aware on the additional data of expanded uh, uh, evaluation of mutations in the, in the RAS pathway. Uh, for example, in the prime study, the initial data was only with the KRAS, Edson 2 mutations, but now we have data on Edson 3, Edson 4, and for NRAS, Edson 2, Edson 3, and Edson 4. And basically, the numbers have increased. When we look only at KRAS mutations, Edson 2, this accounted around 40% of the patients. If we look at all Edsons of KRAS and all Edsons of NRAS, actually we increase the percentage of patients that have mutations up to uh, 60%, between 55 and 60% of the patients. The important message is again that when we look at KRAS 
and NRAS mutations, what we call all RAS mutations, actually we increase the benefit of the patients that receive panitumumab. Basically because we exclude the patients that actually do not benefit because they have mutations in either QRAS or NRAS. So basically at the end, for the time being, we have looked at uh, two different populations that are um, that behave KRAS mutations and NRAS mutations that are resistant uh, to EGFR inhibitors in the first line setting, in the second line, in second line setting. Obviously, there are some other mutations we are looking for. I didn't mention briefly about BRAF because we are going to talk about BRAF. So I think that this is also important. But as you can see, there are other mutations we are looking for, as well as uh, the expression of some important proteins in order to even tune more the population of patients that may benefit from the treatment with uh, an EGFR inhibitors. Let's focus on the BRAF mutant population. As you can see this morning, this is a small population, although that it accounts around 5% of the patients that arrive to the metastatic setting, so 5% of latest stage. We have seen that uh, the mutation itself confers uh, negative prognostic uh, information for EGFR inhibitors. Actually, this is the case for the Tutsimab, as well as ponitumumab, at least for one study, one academic study called the Piccolo study. Not for the other studies like the PRIME and the 181, where the potential predictive um, uh, um, information has not raised in a multivariate analysis. But what is really important in this population is that we try to do the same that our colleagues in melanoma have done with patients that have the BRAF V600 mutation. You are aware that the data on melanoma patients with BRAF mutations, response rate is around 60 to 70 percent of the patients, objective response rate. And actually, uh, uh, Scott Coppets led this trial, small trial, in around 20 patients with colorectal cancer, BRAF, V600 mutations, and only one patient had a partial response. So no thing to do with the data that we had uh, in melanoma. And which, 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 which was the reason for uh, this failure? Basically, several groups at the same time looked back to the preclinical models in trying to elucidate why these patients with colorectal cancer tumors and BRAF V600 mutations did not respond as well as uh, the patients with melanoma tumors did. And basically, uh, as you can see, two publications at the same time, one from the group of Jeff Engelman, the other one from René Bernards, basically the two publications were showing the same. When you, treat, when you treat these cell lines uh, with BRAF mutations, actually, immediately, there is upregulation of several proteins. This has been done in a, in a short harping RNA screening. But basically, you can see that some of the proteins that get upregulated, immediately upregulated, are receptors, um, uh, ectodomain receptors of the malignant cell, including the epidermal growth factor receptor. So with this hypothesis, uh, these groups actually treat these preclinical models with combinations of a BRAF inhibitor plus an EGFR inhibitor. And you can see in these preclinical models, uh, these tumors did very well when they were treated with a combination, whereas there was no effect when they were treated with either Thetuzumab or Bemurafenib as a single agent. So on the basis of this and other studies, I don't have time to show all of them, what is really important is that there are several studies ongoing, phase one, phase two combinations of either an EGFR inhibitor, panitumumab or thetuzumab, with a BRAF inhibitor, and in some instances also a MEK inhibitor and a PA3K inhibitor. So one important message, this data come from the preclinical experiments around two years ago, and you will see this year at the ASCO meeting that there is a special symposium to present part of the data that has been generated in these studies. So things are going to change for the BRAF mutant population, no doubt about this. And I can only present what others have presented before. Basically, data that has been shown in some uh, meetings, patients with BRAF mutations, uh, metastasis, liver metastasis, refractory to chemotherapy, you can see that when these patients are treated with one of these combinations that I mentioned before, they have a dramatic shrinkage of the tumor. This is, uh, uh, as I mentioned, has been presented uh, in, uh, in another um, meeting. Also, there is a, a recent publication from uh, an American investigator showing one single case of a patient that was refractory to several chemotherapy treatments 
also refractory to Thetutsimab. Thetutsimab plus an inotican. And when the patient was treated, it seems, in a compassionate use program with Thetutsimab and Memurafenib, actually this patient did very well. You can see that he had a, a, a beautiful response by, by PET and by, and by PET CT scan. So again, you will see this year at ASCO that the BRAF mutant population for colorectal cancer actually have some very good news uh, and some other ongoing studies will come with uh, non -mur um, new more data. The second population, the final population that I'm, I'm going to talk is about RAS. Obviously, RAS is a wider population and, and realize that we talk about RAS. So K-RAS and RAS mutated uh, patients. This is again, as I mentioned before, around 60% of the patients. It's not clear that RAS mutations actually confer any prognostic effect, but it's clear that they pro, uh, confer a predictive uh, effect for patients that are being treated with either Tetutsimab or Panitumumab. So what do we have for these patients? Actually, the first thing that we have to admit is the KRAS mutant population is a quite a heterogeneous population. It's not as uh, uh, homogeneous as the BRAF mutant population. But there are several preclinical studies that showing that there are some rational based hypotheses uh, for treating these patients with combinations of targeted agents. This is uh, one work that was done uh, again by the group of Jeff Engelman and Carlos Arteaga. It's a, um, it's a study that was uh, published uh, about two years ago. And basically, what we see here is that uh, in cells that are not KRAS mutant, these are cells that are KRAS well type, actually when you treat these cells with a MEK inhibitor, this is the AstraZeneca compound, you can see that there is a shutdown of the, of the downstream of the pathway, so force forward is, is completely abrogated. But at the same time, one of the receptors uh, of the cell, in this case HER3, gets completely upregulated and also the phosphorylated form. And basically the reason for that is that in normal conditions, ERK or MAP kinase actually uh, has a negative feedback for the activation of the receptors. But if you inhibit uh, MEK, uh, you actually are inhibiting this uh, negative feedback and the receptors get upregulated and the signal um, goes uh, over through the PI3K AKT pathway. But actually something similar happens for cells that are KRAS mutant. This is an example of a cell that, it's, uh, that has a G12D mutation. And basically when you treat the, the cell with a MEK inhibitor, you see also an upregulation of HER, uh, of HER3 in this case. But also in these particular models, you do see also upregulation of some other receptors. For example, the insulin-like growth factor receptor. And actually when you combine um, the MEK inhibitor with an EGFR inhibitor like the Tutsima, uh, sorry, like Jefitinib in this case, you completely uh, downregulate the activation of HER3 and in another model that I cannot show to you, the upregulation of the insulin like growth factor receptor. And again, this means that with limited experiments, this is not the only one, we have at least a rationale for combining MEK inhibitors plus uh, uh, tyrosine kinase receptors inhibitors. And basically, this is what is being done at this time point. This is uh, an example of some ongoing clinical studies combining either a MEK, a MEK inhibitor with an EGFR inhibitor in the RAS mutant population, a MEK inhibitor with a dual HER1, HER3 inhibitor. This is a very interesting approach from Genentech, also in the RAS mutant population. And finally, trials that combine MEK inhibitors with insulin like growth factor receptor inhibitors. So the message that I want to, to give to you is that for these particular populations, we are now doing clinical trials based on a, on a hypothesis that have been generated in preclinical models but certainly uh, these uh, hypotheses are being confirmed um, in patients uh, where we do this type of um, um, profiling for the mutation. So that's why it's so important to look more and more in those patients whether they have KRAS and RAS and BRAF mutations because basically we are going to offer um, uh, more opportunities. And my two final slides actually relate to another completely different approach. This is only one slide to show you how difficult it is to look at the different uh, genomic signatures that have been published so far um, in trying to um, identify different subsets of patients with colorectal cancer. And although that you may see that there are several subgroups, even each classification has uh, uh, its own subgroup, 
at the end, most of these groups are very consistent between the different classifications. And another important thing is that there is a, an international collaboration um, um, funded and uh, auspiced by SAGE, by your networks, that it's trying to put all this data in together and try to define one, sing one single uh, signature that could define different subtypes of patients, like, for example, in the breast cancer. So this is also going to be presented at ASCO. And this is my final slide. Basically, we have seen that there are some uh, novel uh, drugs in the field of, tri of, in the treatment of patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. More and more, we'll have to classify these patients based on the genomic aberrations, including mutations, amplifications, but also, I hope, that the genomic signatures may have to define, may help to define this different population. Again, there is tumor heterogeneity. We know, the, we know this in all tumors is the same. Also, an important concept that we are addressing more and more, the clonal evolution and the plasticity of the disease. But at least for the BRAF mutant population, only 5 to 8% of the patients, it doesn't matter. Colorectal cancer is a very frequent disease. You will see that with um, this approach of uh, dual combinations or triple combinations, we have been able actually to aggregate these redundant signals that the models show on a regulation of the epidermal growth factor receptor. So I think that this is a, an excellent example on how we should do in these particular populations. Obviously, um, the only way to move in this field is uh, basically profiling more our patients and try to select them in the appropriate uh, clinical trials. And again, there will be no combination that it's going to succeed with an, with an important hassle ratio, with an important efficacy, unless we do a rational based hypothesis on how these compounds work uh, together. Thank you for your time.